Chapter 11, Rolling Torque and Angular Momentum. Let's start with rolling. Rolling is a special kind of motion. You can think about rolling two different ways. One way is to think of rolling as a combination of rotational motion and translational motion. We've studied rotational kinematics and we've studied translational kinematics. Blend them together and you get rolling. In rolling motion, there's no skidding or sliding. There's no kinetic friction whatsoever. Skidding is a different kind of motion. Sliding is a different kind of motion. We're looking at rolling. So again, you can think of rolling as a combination of rotation and translation. And also, you can think of rolling as pure rotation. In this case, we think of this wheel as an object that is rotating about an axis of rotation defined here at the point of contact. At this point of contact, there is no relative motion between the rolling object and the ground. That's also true when we think of rolling as a combination of rotation and translation. At the point of contact, there's no relative velocity between the rolling object and the ground. No relative velocity means no kinetic friction and it also means no static friction if there's no acceleration. Okay, we looked at rolling motion. Let's look at rolling kinetic energy. Box number one says kinetic energy equals one half I omega squared. The I subscript P refers to the fact that we're using the axis of rotation located at point P in the above picture. Just a reminder, we've worked a lot with kinetic energy equaling one half mv squared for translational motion. For rotation, it's kinetic energy equals one half I omega squared. If the axis of rotation is located at point P, again as shown, box number two says we have to use the parallel axis theorem. That's because instead of rotating about an axis of rotation located at the object's center of mass, the new axis of rotation is parallel but it's offset by a distance r, the radius of the wheel in this case. Box number two says that the rotational inertia about point P is the same as the rotational inertia about the axis going through the center of mass plus MD squared, where M is the mass of the object and D is the offset distance between the new parallel axis and the parallel axis going through the object's center of mass. So in this case, D equals the radius of the wheel. Follow box three really carefully. That's where a lot of the equation work is done. Box number four gives us an expression for the kinetic energy of a rolling object. It's the sum of the object's rotational kinetic energy plus the object's translational kinetic energy. Let's study the forces of rolling or rolling dynamics. If there's no acceleration, a rolling object can roll, meaning there's no skidding or no sliding, even if there's no friction. This is a great visual. It shows a rolling object moving at a constant velocity, meaning the translational acceleration is equal to zero and the angular acceleration is also equal to zero. It also shows birth of a radian. You can see that the arc length shown s, which equals r times theta, is equivalent to that linear distance s. This picture really does say a lot. Box two shows rolling, but now the rolling object is accelerating. The only way a rolling object can accelerate without slipping is if there's static friction. This static friction shown here is the force that prevents skidding or sliding. Now that we know about forces acting on a rolling object, let's consider an object rolling down a ramp. Box nine shows the result. It shows the acceleration of an object rolling down the ramp. To derive the expression shown in box nine, carefully study boxes one through eight. This is a really dense and rich derivation. You're once again using the force analysis method, which now includes torque, rotational inertia, and angular acceleration. Understanding boxes one through nine really positions you well to solve a whole bunch of rotational dynamics problems. One of the key takeaways takeaways shown in box 9 is that the acceleration of a rolling object does not depend at all on its mass or its size. It depends on its shape. A solid sphere, a hollow sphere, a solid disk, a thin walled disk, and a thick walled disk. Okay, it's time to study torque again. This is going to be a much deeper dive. Before we studied torque, when the applied force was perpendicular to the torque arm, here we're going to get a lot more general. 
You grab this crescent wrench. Your goal is to loosen that hex nut. You apply the force shown and notice it's not perpendicular to the torque arm. This applied force will produce a counterclockwise torque. Box one, this applied force will tend to rotate the wrench about the axis that's perpendicular to the plane containing the hex nut. Box two, Vector R is the position vector that originates at the AOR and terminates at the point where the force is applied. Box 3. Let's draw the perpendicular component of this applied force vector relative to the line of action containing the position vector. Box 4. Express this perpendicular component of the force vector in terms of Greek letter phi, the angle, and F. Greek letter phi is the angle between the applied force vector and its associated position vector. Box number five, once again, torque is defined as the product of perpendiculars, where the perpendiculars are comprised of the position vector and the applied force vector. Box six, now let's do something different. Draw the perpendicular component of the position vector relative to the line of action containing the force vector. Box seven shows this perpendicular component in terms of Greek letter phi, and the position vector R. Once again, phi is the angle between the position vector and its associated applied force vector. Box eight, I'm kind of saying the same thing again. Torque is the product of perpendiculars, and in this case, the perpendiculars are the perpendicular component of the position vector and its associated force vector. Box number nine, look at box number eight and number five. They're the same. Box number 10, what's another way to express box number five or box number eight? The answer is the cross product. So box number 10 shows you three different ways to say the same thing. They all basically say torque is the product of perpendiculars. Box number 11 refers to something called the right hand rule, RHR. We'll talk a lot about this in class because we need it right now and you'll need it elsewhere in this course and subsequent courses. Right hand rules are really widespread. In box number 12, I'm repeating myself for the 16th time, torque is the the product of perpendiculars. Specifically, it's the product of perpendicular pairs comprised of an applied force vector and the appropriate position vector. Next section, we're going to calculate torque using unit vectors and the cross product. This section is once again a very dense and very rich derivation. During our live lecture, we'll make a lot of visuals to support what you're going to do here in these steps. Box number one shows the applied force vector in unit vector form. Box number two shows the position vector, also known as the torque arm or moment arm, in unit vector form. Box number three, torque is the product of perpendiculars, so we will apply torque is defined as the position vector crossed with the applied force vector. This is non-commutative. R cross F is not the same as F cross R. Box number four applies the distributive property of multiplication to what you see in box number three. Box number five is identical to box number four. I just grouped the constants together and the unit vectors together. Rx, Ry, and Rz are scalar or constant values, just as Fx, Fy, and Fz are constant or scalar values. In box number six, we figure out what the cross product is of unit vector i hat crossed with unit vector i hat. Here's what we do. We take the magnitude of unit vector i hat, which is equal to one, multiply it by the magnitude of the other vector, which is also i hat. We calculate the sine of the angle between them because sine gives us the perpendicular relationship. And we see that unit vector i hat crossed with another unit vector i hat equals zero. There's no perpendicularity between these two vectors. They're parallel. So any unit vector crossed with itself is also going to equal zero. There's no perpendicularity between two identical unit vectors that are either parallel or anti-parallel. So using what we learn here in box six, we can see that three terms drop out of box five. The i hat cross i hat term, the j hat cross j hat term, and the k hat cross k hat term. In box number seven, we're left with the remaining six terms. In box number eight, we cross the remaining vectors. We'll study this a lot more, but right now we can say that i hat cross j hat gives vector k hat, i hat cross k hat gives vector negative j hat, j hat cross i hat gives vector negative k hat, j hat cross k hat gives vector i hat, 
k hat cross i hat gives vector j hat and last but not least vector k hat cross j hat gives negative unit vector i hat box number nine is identical to box number eight i'm just grouping the i hat j hat and k hat unit vectors together that's it tau torque is defined as r cross f the position vector crossed with the associated applied force vector and this is what you get again in box number nine We've now successfully crossed R into F. This is huge. It has far-reaching implications both in this class and beyond. The cross product provides the sum of all rectangular areas produced by all possible component combinations. We'll talk more about that, but there's a good visual that represents that bullet. The size of this resultant rectangle indicates the magnitude of the perpendicular product, which is the same as the magnitude of the torque. This last bullet says you can use this expression derived in box number nine, or you can use your calculator, or you can use something called Saris's method or equivalent methods as well. Box 11 shows Saris's method. This will get taught in detail in class. Box 12 is an equivalent method. You may have learned yet another method that produces the same result. You need to know these methods. Sometimes it makes the most sense to apply the expression shown in box number 10. Sometimes it makes the most sense to use your calculator. It depends on what you know and what you need to find. Last section, angular momentum and Newton's second law in angular form. Let's check out this short video from OpenStax. For decades, the Winter Olympic Games has drawn people from across the world to marvel at breathtaking athletics on the snow and ice. One of the most popular events is figure skating. Athletes meld acrobatics, dance, and physics into mesmerizing performances. It is the sheer precision that separates the skilled athlete from the novice. Through years of tireless training, skaters must learn to understand and use angular momentum to become the best in their sport. Angular momentum is the product of a skater's moment of inertia and angular velocity and is represented by the letter L. When the skater is rotating with no net external torque acting on her, angular momentum is conserved. With her arms and leg outward, she increases her moment of inertia, which reduces her angular velocity. As she pulls her arms and leg inward, she is able to spin faster since her angular velocity increases while her moment of inertia decreases. And this is how skaters become champions. Okay, here's another dense and rich derivation, so brace yourself. Consider this orange point mass. It has a mass m. It's located at some point relative to an origin given by this position vector r. At this moment, it has a velocity and hence a momentum shown by this momentum vector. The angle between this momentum vector and the position vector is given as Greek letter phi. Start with box one and remember that Newton's second law says that F equals MA and equivalently F equals DPDT. Carefully study boxes two through seven. There's a ton in these boxes. So study carefully, take your time and really learn everything shown in each of these boxes. Box number eight, shows the definition of angular momentum for a particle. Box number nine says that torque equals DL dt. This is analogous to force equals dp dt. As torque is to force, angular momentum is to regular translational momentum. It's important to stress that I should be saying the net torque or the sum of all torques, just like I should say the net force or sum of all forces. Box number 10 shows Newton's second law in rotational form and linear or translational form. Box number 11 seems like a small point, but it's actually pretty significant. You can calculate torque and angular momentum about any point. It doesn't always have to be with respect to a given origin. Box number 12 shows several terms that all mean the same thing. Angular momentum is the product of perpendiculars, just like torque is the product of perpendiculars. What are the perpendiculars that you need to concern yourself with when calculating angular momentum? One of them is the position vector 
vector. This position vector initiates at some point you're interested in, often it's the origin, but it doesn't have to be the origin, and terminates at the point under consideration itself. Vector P is the linear momentum vector, which is mass times velocity. So the angular momentum of a particle is given by any one of these expressions. You use the one that makes the most sense under the given circumstance. Box number 13 once again refers to the right-hand rule as one way to determine the direction of the resulting angular momentum vector. If you're working with unit vectors, you use this expression for magnitude. Angular momentum is a three-dimensional vector, so you apply Pythagoras' theorem shown here. The other way to determine the resultant direction is to use the cross product with unit vectors as inputs. Next section, angular momentum of a rigid body. Now that we know how to determine the angular momentum for a single point, we can figure out the angular momentum of a rigid body, which is basically an assembly of many points. Box number nine, capital letter L, equals omega times i, where omega is the angular speed or angular velocity, and i is the rotational mass of this object. L equals i omega is the rotational analog of p equals mass times velocity. Here's our next conservation law, the conservation of angular momentum. If there's no net external torque acting on the system, there is no change in that system's angular momentum. This is a major cornerstone fact of physics and is used very widely.